Hasn't he been good, good this morning? Oh, wow. You never know what to expect here at Valley Church because it's about his presence and not the plan. Ooh. I'm just going to, I'm going to pray. Oh, Father, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus, Savior. We thank you for saving us this morning from darkness, brokenness, shame, fear, hatred. We're forever grateful. And God, I thank you this morning for the promise in 1 Peter that when we speak, we speak the very words of God. And I pray for the sake of your people, your sheep, your sons and daughters, that right now, you'd burn my lips with your words. You burn my spirit with your heart and your love. I want to be your mouthpiece. So I'm believing and agreeing that that will be so because you're faithful. Thank you that you're in the business of breaking today, that there's going to be breakthrough. There's going to be restoration. There's going to be repentance. And there's going to be your fire. Right now, I just thank you for preparing hearts for your words, even as you have been this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 How many of you love the Psalms? You love the Psalter? I love the Psalms of David. Did you know the Psalms is one of the most prophetic books in the whole Bible, even though it's not considered prophecy? Like in the prophetic section. The Psalms are quoted or referenced or alluded to more than any other book in the New Testament. So when we read David, when we read these anointed words by the Holy Spirit, um, he saw so much of the kingdom that we're living in. He saw so much of who Jesus was and what he'd fulfill. He's on every Psalm. David was seeing ahead to what we are now walking in and even things yet to come. So I just want to open up with Psalm 29 here, and this will be in the Passion uh, for those doing AV. The title is, The Glory God Thunders. King David's poetic praise to God for the last days, the Feast of Tabernacles. Proclaim his majesty, all you mighty champions, you sons of almighty God giving all the glory and strength back to him. Be in awe before his majesty. Be in awe before such power and might. Come worship wonderful Yahweh, arrayed in all his splendor, bowing in worship as he appears in the beauty of holiness. Give him the honor due his name. Worship him wearing the glory garments of your holy priestly calling. (laughs) And then it shifts. The voice of the Lord echoes through the skies and seas. The glory God reigns as he thunders in the clouds. So powerful is his voice, so brilliant and bright. How majestic as he thunders over the great waters. His tympanic thunder topples the strongest of trees. His symphonic sound splinters the mighty forests. Now he moves Zion's mountains by the might of his voice, shaking the snowy peaks with his ear-splitting sound. The lightning fire flashes, striking as he speaks. God reveals himself 
when he makes the fault lines quake, shaking deserts, speaking his voice. God's mighty voice makes the deer to give birth. His thunderbolt voice lays the forest bare. In his temple, all fall before him with each one shouting, Glory, glory, the God of glory. In his temple, all fall before him with each one shouting, Glory, glory, the God of glory. Above the furious flood, the enthroned one reigns. The king God rules with eternity at his side. This is the one who gives his strength and might to his people. This is the Lord giving us his kiss of peace. Amen? Oh, he's good. As I was preparing, uh, the Lord reminded me of a memory when I was seven years old that I haven't thought about in a long time. I was living in Connecticut. Anyone here from the Northeast? Okay, wow. Okay, we got a couple people. So I grew up in, in, in Northeast. I was born in Brooklyn, moved around in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. And I was seven years old. Um, we lived on a couple acres. We had a, it was the largest home I ever lived in. And I was with my brother David. I love my brother David. If you're watching this on live stream, I love you. Um, amazing older brother who loves to worship the Lord, has a heart of worship like David. And we were sitting, he was, uh, uh, he must have been, I was seven, he's eight years older, let me do the math here, 15, I guess he was 15 years old if my math is correct, and we were on the second floor, we were sitting with the windows open, my brother Dave was sitting on this windowsill, and I was watching, and it was that feeling right before the storm. How many of you love that feeling before the storm? You feel the charged air, the dark clouds come. And then all of a sudden, we heard that slight trickle. Tap, 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 tap. And my brother Dave and I are watching, and then all of a sudden, we heard huge lightning bolt in the field about a thousand feet away goes whoop, and we hear this loud pop and he, we looked over at each other was like are you kidding me what just happened we didn't know whether to fall to our knees give glory to god hide under the covers terrifying how many have heard terrifying lightning well boom it pops especially if it's in a valley or something it echoes off the hills and the mountains and then within a little bit, um, we started to see smoke rise from that shack. And then not too long after that, really quickly, we started to see flames come up. It was a shack in the middle of this large field. And then within just a little bit, it was engulfed in fire. My brother, who was into photography, and he's still into photography, ended up getting his camera lens, going down and taking pictures as the fire department was showing up, and they ended up using his, his, his photos in the, the papers the next day, but it consumed this large shack, just the whole thing, and they were able to catch it before it, you know, set the whole field on fire, but that, I'll never forget that moment, and I think it's just a beautiful picture of this psalm that... When the, vo when the Lord speaks, his voice is like lightning. When it's his voice, it's charged with love and power that's hot. I, I don't know the exact stats, but the, the degree of heat, charged high heat in a lightning bolt is, is off the charts. And sometimes his voice has a tendency to set things on fire. Yeah? Can I get an amen to that? Yeah. Anyone been set on fire by the voice of God? Yeah. You know, each of us here has a story, or maybe today is your day, and I'm just, I'm just going to speak that right now. There's some of you here who maybe never heard the voice of God. You've never heard His love for you. And I believe today there's going to be a few of you that you're going to come to hear that voice and you're going to come into relationship with Jesus Christ. 
I just speak that. If that's you right now, you're in a safe place. You're in the house of God. And he came, as we sang this morning and you heard, he is Savior. He came to save us from all the shame, the guilt, the lust, the lying, the things that we hate that we do, but yet we can't, keep, we can't stop doing them. He came to save us from those things. So I just believe some today, you don't know Jesus as Savior, and I just speak, we're going to have a prayer team later, that you're going to receive Jesus as Savior. If that's you, you don't need to raise your hand. Come up to the front, and we would love to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ as Savior in your heart. But for each of us, there came a point, and maybe you're remembering now, when lightning struck in your life and you heard the voice of God for the first time. For me, it was in Woodbury, New Jersey, so it was about uh, five, six years after that moment with David. We had moved down to New Jersey, and it was a very rough time. Junior high, how many agree junior high can be a really difficult time? Hormones, you're going through a lot, you want to fit in, you don't fit in. Um, I found myself just longing for love, you know, and being with the cool crowd, getting rejected by the cool crowd, all that, and just an aching in my heart for something more. And I remember in a very desperate time, even though I had Bibles, you know, within inches of me, feet of me, since I was little, because my dad was a pastor, I never really read the word out of relationship, wanting to hear God for myself. But you know, when you're desperate, you reach out. And I was desperate, consumed with worry, lying, lust, yet aching for a love that was more. And I remember flipping open my Bible to Matthew 6, and you don't need to pull it up. And Jesus said, Do not be anxious about anything. Isn't the life, isn't life more, more than clothes? Look how he clothes the lilies of the field. Look how he takes care of the birds. They don't have to store away in barns. Aren't you much more valuable than them? And I go, and the Spirit of God, I could hear, wait a minute, this isn't just Jesus' words from 2,000 years ago. He was speaking to me. He was speaking his value over me. He was saying, Matthew, you don't need to worry. You don't need to be anxious. And then he said, you don't need to be like the pagans who run after all these things, trying to find ways to to fill the hole. The pagans do that, those that don't know me. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all those other things will be taken care of and added unto you. And for the first time, that verse came home because the lightning struck and the verse and and the Lord spoke and I knew, you've made me righteous. I have a right relationship with you because of your blood, because of the price you paid. And that I knew that you could be first in my heart because you valued me and you loved me and that I could seek you first above all these other things. I remember during that time, I, I love rock and roll and I, I would listen to Beatles music just literally by myself at eight o'clock at night listening to Beatles because it's all about love and all that and dreaming, maybe that girl at school, maybe, maybe she'll like me, maybe this girl, just aching. Ooh, I need your love, babe. Yes, you know it's true. I hope you need my love, babe. But I would sing those, and, and, and they're fun songs, right? But there was a deep cry in me for love because we were all created for love. Everyone here, your deepest need is to know that you're valued and you're loved. Let me say it again. Your core, deepest of deep need is to know you're valued and you're loved. And when the need isn't met, the heart's sick. But that day in my room in Woodbury, New Jersey, I began to feel the love of God for the first time. Oh, I had prayed the sinner's prayer many times. But that's when the lightning struck. As I reflected back on that time, I I love hymns. I'll try not to sing too much this morning. I might sing a little more later. We'll see. I couldn't help but sing. 
I remember uh, my dad was a pastor of Wood, uh, Baptist Church in Woodbury, and I had liked the idea of learning guitar before that, but never had the passion or drive to do it, even though I had the desire. And I liked to sing, but I didn't do a lot of singing. And when Jesus' love came home to me, I said, I need a guitar. My parents got me a guitar. I began to learn guitar, and in my room, just worshiping Jesus, singing these songs I heard as a kid, but now I knew they were my songs that I could sing. They weren't something my parents did. My parents are pastors, so I guess I'm a Christian. His love had come home to me. And I remember singing this song, Pass It On. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on. That was the first song I got to sing in front of the church. My dad's like, sure, take the mic. He knew God had done a work in my life, and I got to sing that song. I just wanted to sing. I wanted to shout it from the mountaintops of his love. But even with all that, we ended up moving to another place in New Jersey. So that was near Philly, and we ended up moving near the Jersey Shore Beautiful beaches there, warm water, not like the West Coast. I love warm water. Can I get an amen? Who here has been in warm, hot water? You don't even need to warm up. You can dive right in. So I love those two years. We were half block. My dad was the pastor of Seaside something church. I can't remember. And I was a, a, block from, uh, a block from the beach. And I went to Tom, Tom's River High School and still on fire for Jesus, loving Jesus. But in the first couple weeks there, I ended up meeting a girl, a Christian girl. And uh, first, it was a friendship, and then there was attraction, and before you knew it, we had soul ties and spent most of my sophomore year consumed with her. Wasted a year of my life. Anyone else done that? <laughs> But even though Jesus had been faithful, right, to show me his love, and maybe like many of you, you can remember how many times that you were lured away by other things. And I spent that year, it's, it's funny, you know, you know your, your high school love and all that, but it was something the Lord didn't want for me at that time in my life, and it derailed me for a year. Then God began to speak again. I began to hear his voice, and he just showed me, Matthew, I miss you. I miss the first love that you were walking in with me. That soul tie got all my time and energy. I wanted to hold her hand. I wanted to, I want to hold your hand. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to be singing Beatles the whole time. I, is that okay? No. Um, but I wanted to be with her. I wanted to hold her hand. I wanted to spend, and, and, and yet my heart in the end went to dissatisfaction. Because she could never provide what Jesus can only provide. Only Jesus can fill that God hole. And I love my wife, and we have 17 years, and I love the love that we get to experience for one another. But she's not my source. Jesus is. Only Jesus can satisfy and marriage is a beautiful thing. And the love of God flows through our marriage, and I'm thankful for that. But Jesus is my source. So again, the Lord began to speak, and I began to hear his voice, and I repented, and I broke up with her. I said, I, I can't be in relationship any longer. We broke up. And that summer, after my sophomore year, was a year of repentance. How many know that sometimes we go through seasons of repentance we can know the Lord 60, 70, 80. It doesn't matter. He'll bring us into that because he loves us. The kindness of the Lord. I think it, Pastor Christie was saying it. His kindness leads us to repentance. And through all that, he didn't beat me over the head. He said, son, I miss you. Okay, you're going to go off with her for a year. But he was waiting the whole time. I want you back. I loved when you would just sing to me in your room. But you stopped doing that. That summer I began to repent and I ended up, God just did a, restoke the fires of, of first love and 
I found myself singing again. It was, it was always, it's always been a barometer. If I, if I stop singing, something's wrong. That's just me. That may not be your relationship. Maybe it's something else. If you stop doing art or you stop worshiping, you know, for me, if I stop singing, Matthew, you're not singing. What's going on? You can call me out on that because it's probably, I may not be walking in first love at that time. So we ended up, I ended up going to Creation East Festival. Anyone heard of the Creation Festivals? So this is back in the day. Newsboys, Delirious. Okay, I see a couple hands. Um, and, you know, just in this season of repentance, and the Lord's so good. Isn't he good to bring people in your life even for just a day or a weekend that mark you with the love of God? And they become these pillars that you didn't even know them really well, but God worked through them. We ended up, our church there in Seaside, our whole youth group, partnered up with a, another church. We had a few people from that church. I don't even remember that. I think Point Pleasant uh, it was, in, it was in Jersey. And I ended up, there was this man, Tyler Sherman. And Tyler was one of the coolest guys ever. He's still living. I just pinged him on Facebook. I'm, I'm waiting on a response. I was just wondering if he's still alive and still thriving. And he's, according to Facebook, it seems like he's still thriving in Jesus. But he had just such an impact on me. And after the Creation Festival, we'd hear all these bands. We'd be around the fire at night. And there'd be 10, 15 of us, and one of them had a drum, and he would just play his guitar, and he would worship Jesus, and I would just see the love of Jesus on his face, and he would weep. And I go, I know I, Jesus is love, but I want, I want what he has. He, he, I just could feel the love of God on him. Something I totally forgot till years later, till I, till I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, is he ended up laying hands on me and prophesying. Totally didn't, I didn't even know what he was doing at the time. I'm like, what is this? And he spoke words directly from God, and lightning struck. And then many years later, the Holy Spirit says, Matthew, you're learning prophetic, but you had a prophetic word years ago when you were 16. And I just didn't know what it was, Right? At the end of that creation festival, we ended up, just him and I got to drive back from Pennsylvania to New Jersey. He's an ex-hippie, or still a hippie in Jesus. He came to Jesus through studying near-death experiences. So he started studying those. He didn't know Jesus, and he found that there's always this light. There's these themes, right? People would see Jesus and all that, and eventually for him, that brought him to the Lord. And the whole ride back, he's just in the Holy Spirit. And I go, I want what this guy has. Um, we, would, we listened to Beatles for like two hours in the Spirit. <laughs> I ain't got nothing but Jesus love eight days a week. And he was just singing Jesus songs. We're swerving on the road. You know, help, I need somebody help, but not anybody help, right? And he's just singing, and he's just free-flowing with Jesus and the, the van is filled with Jesus' love. I see it all over Tyler's face. And it was a glory ride. I didn't have those words like I have now. But it marked me. And isn't the Lord so good? His kindness leads us to repentance. Tyler was kind. He, he showed the love of God because he was, his first love was Jesus. And he was so filled with the Spirit of God and the love of God that it brought me out of, I don't want that sin anymore. I want what he has. You know? Senior year, we move again. Moving's hard when you're in high school. And I'm seeing a couple nods and a couple faces here. I moved three times, three high schools, two in Jersey, and then we went up to Massachusetts. And um, it was very hard. Because you're uprooted, all your friends, a lot, uh, there was a couple times where I found out we moved like a month before. I feel like I barely had time to say goodbye to people. And so I went to Braintree High School. Boston is a great area, a lot of history there, but a rough area. Uh, kids can be tough in Boston. I ended up we, we ended up getting a, a computer at home for the first time. And my heart was hurting. 
and instead of running to Jesus, I clicked a couple things in that browser that I shouldn't have typed. And it led to several months of darkness and pornography. Yet Jesus was waiting the whole time, weeping. And I went into several months of torment and trying to fill with something that will never fill. And then I remember a couple months into that, needing, just getting desperate and saying, God, I don't want to do this anymore. And the Spirit began to just breathe repentance over me again. I mean, Jesus is so faithful. I don't deserve to stand up here as a pastor. It's only by his blood and his grace and his forgiveness that I can. That's the only reason I'm up here. And I just feel like maybe this is speaking to some of you. You're like, I've known Jesus a while, and yet I, I find myself in sin again. Or how many times, even now, you want to thrive, but you're like, I've left him too many times. He is faithful, even when we're not. He loves when we're loveless. He doesn't give up. And then I reached, I remember for a daily bread, the Lord reminded me of this just before service, and the daily bread that day that I started to repent and said, I'm done with pornography, was Jonah in the belly of the whale. Amen, Kiki? And I just broke and just cried, and I felt like I was in a belly of a whale for three months of hell. And the Lord just showered his love on me and I began to weep and my heart began to break. Because that's what sin does. It hardens our heart. Sin is a serious thing because your heart matters. Your heart matters to Jesus. And I just want to say this boldly. Sin matters. Sin hardens the heart. Sin closes us off from enjoying that relationship. And I, I ended up, I won't sing it now, but God gave me a song, and I ended up singing that as a repentance based on the story of Jonah. And I wrote a song, and I just worshiped the Lord. And then sure enough, in my neighborhood, my dad pastored about 20 minutes away, but I wasn't really, felt like I was being fed there. There was an Assemblies of God church right up the street. And I began going there, not even knowing, not even really experiencing all the Holy Spirit, but I was so attracted to what they had at that Assemblies of God church. I could feel the love among the youth pastor and the, and the, and the teenagers, and I would, I would go there, and I'm just like, I love being here. There's just so much love. I can feel his presence. So he brought Tyler. He brought this assembly. He's so faithful. Isn't he faithful? He's so faithful. I want to go to uh, Hebrews 12 here. Hebrews 12. This is kind of the main passage the Lord put on my heart. Hebrews 12. Let's do verses... um, 14, can we do 14 through 29? Well, let's just start at 14. Um, you know what? Let's do passion. Let's do passion. Let's do the passion version. How many of you like the passion version? Come on, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it because I grew up with the scriptures and I love the scriptures so much. And then I'll go and read something for the first time, the passion, go, whoa. And it just breathes fresh life on scriptures that maybe sometimes you go a little, little cold to. So um, if you haven't read the Passion and you're, you know the word well and you want fresh, uh, fresh breath on it, um, I highly recommend it. Um, okay, so verse 14 in the Passion here. And again, uh, just a little context here. Hebrews is about the God who speaks. So at the, at the very beginning of Hebrews, it says, in, in the past, our forefathers, they spoke in various ways through the prophets and all these ways. But in these last days, God speaks through the Son. 
I love in the Passion because it basically says, the little commentary is, God now speaks one language and it's son. He speaks, that's his language. He speaks sonship. It's the language, what's God's language? Sonship. It's not Greek, Aramaic, it's sonship. It's love, it's sonship. And you can include daughtership in that, right? I'm speaking to sons and daughters, right? And then it proceeds to show how comparing Jesus to the angels, Jesus is superior. And then it shows Jesus to Moses. And it says, Moses was awesome, but Jesus is superior. And the high priest, right? And it, and it goes into, I believe, Aaron and all that. It even goes into Joshua and says, Joshua provided a rest, but ultimately they ended up not really getting that rest. Jesus provides the real rest, right? So it's, it's here's what it was in the Old Testament, Jesus. Here's what it was in the Old Testament, Jesus. Talks about the holy place and all that and all the different things. that. But now we have a heavenly Jerusalem and we have a high priest who brings us into the holy place through his blood, it's this crescendo, right? It's this building of Hebrews. I recommend go read Hebrews, study Hebrews. It is beautiful. If you want to fall in love with Jesus and you want to see how supreme Jesus is to encourage you, I encourage you to get in his presence. I was sharing this with someone the other day, um, and this was helpful to them, so I'm just going to pass it on. Is like, How do you read the word? We were basically talking about that. I love to get in his presence, not go to a commentary, not go to something on YouTube, get in his presence and begin to hear his voice, experience him, and then go and read the Bible. Can I get an amen to that? If you are not doing that, you're like, I don't know how to get in the word, I say get in his presence and then go, God, what book do you desire? What do I need to hear? And what he says, go read. Several Fridays ago, I did that. I went through the whole Gospel of John after all the kids were down, and I just got blasted by the glory of God, the life of God, the love of Jesus, and just got renewed and washed by the Word. Okay, so this is all a build. So I'm just trying to recap some to where we're going. So Jesus supreme, Jesus supreme. And then it says, let's enter the most holy place because all this has been provided, right? Right? But then we, we go into 11 and the heroes of faith. So we're commanded to walk by faith. Okay, now in this expression, we're walking by faith, the heroes of faith. And then that all builds. And then in the beginning of chapter 12, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of, of your faith. And when you run this race, we're all in a race. Cast off that sin that so easily entangles. And it builds in 12, and this is essentially the crescendo. There is a chapter 13, but those are just final exhortations. So what I'm reading to you here is the crescendo of the whole book. It's all building to this, and I believe that this is a word for many of you here today. Some of you are going to take different things from this, but this is what I believe the words God's given. So just open your heart to this. In every relationship, be swift to choose peace over competition. I'm looking at Tim Fish because we talked about competition this week. Lord's getting me through this. And run swiftly towards holiness for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Let me say this. When we're in sin as believers, we forget that we're holy in his sight. Therefore, we don't act holy. You don't lose your holiness but you're not in agreement with it because your actions aren't lining up with who he says you are. Therefore, you go blind. Let me say it again. You are holy and blameless in his sight if you know him as Savior and, and you believe he saved you and he lives in your heart and you've experienced his love. You are holy. But when we sin, we get scales on our eyes and we don't see ourselves as he sees us anymore as holy. Therefore, we don't act holy. Because that's important, because you can be like, I, I'm holy, I sinned, I lost my holiness. I'm holy, I sinned, I lost my holiness. And you can live this yo-yo life, and that's not what he's given us. He's given us freedom, okay? Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. His unmerited favor, like he showed to me throughout high school, poured out his love, lightning struck. I heard the voice of God, felt the love of God, wanted to sing, and then I strayed. But his grace was sufficient through all that. His grace continued to pursue me. 
And don't think because we're under New Testament that God's still not a raging fire. His grace is raging. (sighs) And make sure that no one lives with a root of bitterness sprouting within them, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. Bitterness is a huge thing. And I just speak today, there might be one, two, three, there's some of you today that are still holding on to resentment or bitterness. It could be from a fresh wound, or from the past. But I just believe today, even now, as right now, he's going to take it away, that he's going to soften your heart. And some of you might come to the altar later and he'll do it then. But I just speak, break off all bitterness because with that bitterness, there's not the holiness and you can't see the Lord and his love for you. Bitterness is destructive, very destructive. Okay? Can I keep going here? How are we doing? Okay. Be careful that no one among you lives in immortality, becoming careless about God's blessing. I became careless about God's blessing. Like Esau, who traded away his rights as the firstborn for a simple meal. And as we know that later on, when he wanted to inherit his father's blessing, he was turned away, even though he begged for it with bitter tears, for it was too late then to repent. Those are some severe words. But no, if you re- read that through the revelation of Christ, I believe the revelation there on this side of things is that his repentance couldn't redo what the cross already accomplished. Okay? That's, that's for later on. But anyway, I just want to say that. Bitterness, and some of you might have bitterness today, and you can't see the Lord, it's creating a block. Some of you, there's sexual immorality. And his kindness leads us to repentance. And then here we go, entering into God's presence is the title here. For we are not coming as Moses did to a physical mountain with its burning fire, thick clouds of darkness and gloom, and with a raging whirlwind. We are not those who are being warned by the jarring blast of a trumpet and the thundering voice, the fearful voice that they begged to be silent. They couldn't handle God's command that said, if so much as an animal approaches the mountain, it is to be stoned to death. The astounding phenomenon Moses witnessed caused him to shudder with fear, and he could only say, I am trembling in terror. That's the old system. We're not under that anymore. We are under the new covenant. And that's what he's going to get into right here. You want to hear some good news. By contrast, we have already come near to God in a totally different realm. The Zion realm. Zion in the Old Testament represented God's presence. It was a stronghold that David took back. And he, that's when he had David's tent and 24-7 worship. There wasn't all the protocol. The Gentiles could be in. You guys have come to that realm. For we have entered the city of the living God, which is in the new Jerusalem in heaven. We have joined the festal gathering of myriads of angels in their joyous celebration. We've come to a joy fest. We haven't come to a somber, fearful mountain. We haven't come to separation. We've come to a union. When one sinner repents, the angels rejoice. That's what we've come to. And they're rejoicing right now. I believe even as we worship, they're, they're, wor- they're joining. They're, they're in joyful worship in heaven. And as members of the church of the firstborn, all our names have been legally registered as citizens of heaven. And we have come before God who judges all and who lives among the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect in his eyes. Oh, That's some good news. This is really good news. And as members of the church of the firstborn, the firstborn gets the double blessing. The firstborn, Jesus is the fulfillment of the firstborn. He he is the firstborn among many brethren. Your names have been legally registered as citizens of heaven. If you know Jesus, your name is registered in heaven. We're not talking United States registration, although I'm thankful that I'm a United States citizen. We're talking heaven. That's where you're registered from. That's your true city. That's your true home. 
And we have come before God who judges all and who lives among the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect in his eyes. No small price was paid for you to be righteous. Let me say it again. No small price was paid for you to be righteous. What is righteousness? It's divine approval. It's the Father's approval because of what was done in Jesus. It's the Father's approval because of what was done in Jesus on your behalf, the sacrifice that was made. When you know you're righteous and you've received by faith, as, as I believe Pastor Christy shared last week, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why was, he, why was Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Because it was the power of God for everyone who believes. Why was it the power of God? Because in this good news, gospel means good news, a right standing from God is revealed. That is by faith. Faith is receiving, trusting, in what Jesus has done, the just shall live by faith. Guys, righteousness, I know, can sound like a legal Christian term. It is massive. He has made us righteous. He has given us a right standing. And we've been made, because of this righteousness, I love the passion here, we're perfect in his eyes. Righteousness has to do with his approval, how he sees you. You're in right standing with him. And we have come to Jesus who established a new covenant. Can I say new covenant again? A new covenant. Not like one we've ever seen before. Because in the old covenant, in the, in, in, in the Mosaic, we had to measure up. He who does these things, right? They had to follow everything, but they always fell short. Because God wanted to put an end to flesh. He wanted to put an end to our effort to try to be right in God's sight. And we have come to Jesus who established a new covenant with his blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat. Blood that continues to speak from heaven. There's a blood that speaks from heaven. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. When I was caught in a soul tie in 10th grade, Matthew, forgiveness. When I was stuck in sexual immorality, forgiveness. And that's what he's saying to you this morning. Heaven is speaking forgiveness. This is a better message than Abel's blood that cries from the earth, justice. That was a prophetic beginning, so to speak, with Cain and Abel of the judicial, right, and even the law and all that, but ultimately there's a better word because this is something that trumps all that. It's the blood of Christ that forgives, and it comes from heaven, the highest seat of authority, the highest seat of authority speaks forgiveness over you. Right now, if you're in sin and you're struggling, hear the voice of God. Forgiveness. Forgive her, for she knows not what she does. Forgive him, for he knows not what he does. Make sure that you never refuse to listen to God when he speaks. For the God who spoke on earth from Sinai... That's where the Ten Commandments were given. That's where all the fear was. You go close to God. Moses was afraid to go to God. Is the same God who now speaks from heaven. It's the same God. Not a different God. Those who heard him speak his living word on earth found nowhere to hide. So what chance is there for us to escape if we turn our backs on God and refuse him hear, to hear his warning as he speaks from heaven? The earth was rocked at the sound of his voice from the mountain, but now he has promised, once and for all, I will not only shake the systems of the world, but also the unseen powers in the heavenly realm. Let me read that again. You got to hear this. This is powerful. This is powerful revelation. I love whoever the author of this. I can't remember his name, but I do believe that this is the revelation here. Once and for all, I will not only, this is Haggai. This was prophesied in Haggai. Once and for all, I will not only shake the systems of the world, but also the unseen powers in the heavenly realm. He's shaken every system, all the demonic systems, every system that tries to speak, this is how you get just. This is who rules. All those things. He has now spoken a word. Jesus is exalted to the highest seat. He sits at the right hand, and it says, after he made purification for your sins, he sat down. He is sitting upon your redeemed innocence, a throne of your redeemed innocence, where the highest cost was paid. This is more precious than gold and silver and diamonds and rubies. 
This was the blood of the innocent son of God who created all things, it says. The creator's blood. If anyone didn't need to give the blood, it was him, yet he's love, so he did. Now, this phrase, once and for all, clearly indicates the final removal of things that are shaking. That is the old order. So only what is unshakable will remain. Listen up. This is key here. Since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, we should be extremely thankful and offer God the purest worship that delights his heart. As we lay down our lives in absolute surrender, filled with awe, for our God is a holy, devouring fire. When all the dust settles and economies rise and economies fall and wars happen and wars cease, only righteousness will stand. And you've been given a kingdom of righteousness, right standing with God, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let us not take lightly what he's given. How do we not take lightly? Offer God the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender, filled with awe. And even, I won't go into this, but as you get in the Greek there too, part of worship is your enjoyment of it. Are you enjoying what he's paid for? Are you enjoying his love? Does each warning you, God, thank you for your presence that it's only by your blood I can enter. And then do you enter in and say, fill me. Let me hear you. Let me sense your presence. He, God is most satisfied. God is most glorified in you when you're most satisfied in him. Not in the things of the world. Not in idolatries. Not in sexual immorality. It will never please I'd like the prayer team to come up. Since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, we should be extremely thankful and offer God the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender, filled with awe for our God is a holy, devouring fire. It doesn't just say he acts like that. It says he is a holy, devouring fire. See, God, our God is a consuming fire. He didn't just come to baptize in the Holy Spirit, but it says the Holy Spirit and fire. You see, the fires of his love, it both comes to incinerate sin and ignite his love and his passion in you. It's not one without the other. And I'll just share this testimony to, to I believe, to build faith. When, when Bethel was here, no one prayed over me a baptism of fire. But I, when Tess and I were getting blessed with the staff that day and Barb was praying too and Peter, I felt God's heat, his burning, raging love come over me. And now three or four times since then, I'll just look in the mirror and it looks... I don't do this anymore, but it looks like I just drank wine and I can feel his raging love coming out of me. He's a jealous lover. He's a raging fire. And I just believe we're gonna, we're gonna have an altar and, 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 I, and I'll do, I'll, I'll <laughs> Lord Jesus. Can we all stand? The kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance. I just say for many of you, he's been speaking to you and it maybe was that point when we talked about bitterness. And you don't have to wait to come up, but 
I would just, if, if, if that was you, come up. If you're like, man, I still have resentment towards someone, a mother, a father, a spouse. We're, we've been getting in fights, my wife and I, and I'm holding things against her. That will keep you from seeing the Lord and living in the light of how he sees you. So I just want to encourage you. He wants that to go. He wants the bitterness to go because he loves you so much and he paid a high price. For some of you, it may be sexual immorality. And that this is not something you have to, you know, come and share all the details and all that. This, this is between you and the Lord. I don't want to take that lightly. That's, that's a private thing, but it's a severe thing. And he wants it to go because he loves you. He has something so much more for you than that. And he can free you in a moment. So if there's, if there's some of you maybe struggling with that, I, I just say, come up here. This is a house of love, not of shame. There's no shame here. That's not the environment here. This is a house of acceptance because of the blood of Christ and because of the love of Jesus. And then finally, I just want to invite up those of you that you're like, well, it's not sexual immorality or bitterness, but I am just, I have fell from my first love. I don't do the things. I don't sing anymore. I don't, it's just become duty and form. I'm just going through the motions and trying to be right. I'm trying to seek an experience. But you're doing it in your own effort. And God, I just believe, wants to, 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 to baptize you in fire. He wants to baptize you in fire. And I just want to say this. When you were filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't leave. But it's a fresh awareness. He's still there. You're just not aware. Because things have made your heart hard. And as, as Jerry continues to play, I, I, I just believe that there's some here and, and you can come up to me or, or some others here, but I want to pray for a fresh fire to fall on you. Because when this fire comes on you, turning from sin is easy. He just incinerates it because you're so overcome by his intoxicating love. You're burning with passion as you realize how much he loves you. And then you begin to do the things you did at first. You begin to sing spontaneously. You begin to love others spontaneously because fire is spontaneous and it'll erupt and it'll go here and it'll go there and it'll consume there and it'll begin spreading in your marriage and spreading in your family and spreading in your neighborhood. So come to the front. I want to pray if you want, if you want an ex me to lay hands or pray for you for his fire and I would just say this is a soft close but please for the sake of ministry conversations out the door if you do need to go you can but if you feel led to stay and just receive and pray then pray and receive